Welcome back to Quick Bits. I cannot believe that it is already September. There is lots of law happening and the fall is gonna be busy right up until about November. And then all of the lawyers are gonna be like, hey, it's Thanksgiving, it's Christmas, we uh, see you in the new year. <laughs> so we're gonna be busy. We're gonna be busy. And if you wanna make sure that you don't miss a thing, you're going to need the Lawnard app at lawnardapp.com. Today, we need to talk about the headlines you might've been seeing in the death of Matthew Perry about one of the doctors taking a plea deal. The media is treating this like this is new news, but we've already covered this here, so I'm gonna clarify for you real quick. Also, there is a new Real Housewives of Beverly Hills lawsuit. No, it doesn't have anything to do with Tom Girardi's conviction or Erica Jane. It has to do with Kyle Richards' former husband, Mauricio Umaski, and his company, the agency, which has also been subject to its own reality television. So we're gonna go through that just real quickly and then break down everything that happened in both the Corey Richens case out of Utah and the Brian Koberger prosecution out of Idaho. And that's not all because we have to go back to Boston and talk about the wrongful death lawsuit filed against Karen Reed and others. The quick bits are gonna be busy bits, so let's get going. I'm legal analyst Emily D. Baker. This is The Quick Bits, where I break down just the main points of the pop culture and entertainment cases I'm currently covering on YouTube and The Emily Show podcast. Let's get into it. First, it's been really nice to be able to share quick updates on the stories that we're covering, even when they're not getting full deep dives here in Quick Bits. I have really tried to bring in stories that I think you might be interested in that haven't gotten covered elsewhere to make sure that Quick Bits not only keeps you in the loop on breaking down the longer form content, but it also keeps you in the loop on things I haven't had a chance to cover in a longer way. And I hope that that's helpful for you. One of those stories is regarding one of the doctors in Matthew Perry's death. You'll remember when I covered this both on Quick Bits and on the Emily Show podcast that there were two doctors charged, Dr. Chavez and Dr. P. Dr. P was charged with the co-defendant, AKA the ketamine queen. They were charged in a separate indictment together. There were other defendants that were each charged in their own indictments and those were unsealed at the same time. They went after Dr. P and ketamine queen which indicates to me that the feds had targeted those two and used Dr. Chavez, the assistant and the middleman Fleming to provide the basis to go after Dr. P and the ketamine queen. So those three had agreed to plea deals before the filings were even made. They would have been targets of the investigation. The feds would have said, would you like to tell us what you know? And it seems that these three defendants all said, yes, please which sometimes is not a hard decision to make when you know that you might be facing quite a lot of prison and that's never um, how you thought that was going to go. So all of the headlines regarding the doctor in this case is Dr. Chavez, the doctor from San Diego, who was using his connections and his ketamine clinic to provide ketamine to Dr. P up in Santa Monica, who was then providing it to Matthew Perry's assistant. Dr. Chavez has already agreed to take a plea deal to one count of conspiracy to distribute ketamine. He is out of custody on a $50,000 bond. As part of those bond conditions, he is not to practice medicine. At his court appearance on August 30th, the assistant U.S. attorneys indicated that at an administrative hearing the last week of August, Dr. Chavez had agreed to surrender his California medical license. It's interesting to see that this is a part of what will ultimately be this plea negotiation, that this doctor will be choosing to surrender his license versus having to go through the full administrative process and see if the State of California Medical Board takes his license. So he has agreed to surrender that. And we heard from his attorney after this hearing. The attorney for Dr. Chavez stated, quote, my client has accepted responsibility and he's doing everything in his power to cooperate, to help with this situation. And he's incredibly remorseful. Quote, Mark's doing everything he can to try to accept responsibility for what happened with this offense. I mean, with the death of Matthew Perry, you mean? It goes on to say he is cooperating to the full extent possible. I don't even know what that means. To try and right the wrong that happened here. It's interesting that his attorney did not specifically name the wrong that happened here, which is that Matthew Perry died. And cooperating to the full extent possible 
is there something else to do? He is cooperating fully. The hedging language from the lawyer is a little interesting to me. We know that Dr. Chavez has provided information. We know that he surrendered his medical license. So he's going to not be prosecuted for anything else in connection with this based on those agreements. So it's interesting that there is still some of that distancing and hedging um, instead of saying Dr. Chavez is incredibly remorseful about the death of Matthew Perry. He trusted Dr. P to be providing medical care properly, and therefore he is cooperating fully with the government to try to right the wrong that resulted in the death of Matthew Perry. But again, lawyers aren't always PR, and they are trying to protect their client first, and they don't always think through when they are making those statements because they are thinking lawyer first, which I understand. But it's interesting to hear more clearly that this defendant, and I expect the middleman defendant and the assistant to, when they have their court appearances, essentially do the same thing, set a date for a plea, and then that sentencing will be put over until the prosecutions are likely done with the other two indicted defendants. So we will see more of these court hearings, but these pleas were agreed upon before the filings were even made. These three defendants, Dr. Chavez, the assistant, and the middleman, all waived their grand jury. So it was an immediately a complaint that was filed with an agreement to take a plea. So these aren't new things as they come up. They're going to go to court. They're going to set a day for a plea. The sentencing is going to get put over until they're done cooperating with the investigation and potential trial of the two co-defendants and any subsequent or additional arrests that are made. And staying in the realm of Hollywood, we're going to talk Real Housewives of Beverly Hills for just a moment. And in the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills world, Tom Girardi was convicted of all four counts of wire fraud. His sentencing is set for December. You might have seen me quoted in People as their legal expert talking about this or on Nightline. And if not, those two things will be linked down below if you're interested in a little bit more of my thoughts on the conviction, but the sentencing will be in December. He's facing up to 80 years. He's not going to get 80 years, but that is the maximum potential sentence. I do think he will get a prison sentence. We're yet to see what that will be. I'll be very interested to see what the recommendation is from both the pre-sentencing report and from the government's sentencing memorandum. In the sentencing memorandum, the government can bring in more information, the amount of money stolen, not just for the named victims in this case, the total amount of victims, the bar complaints going back decades. They can bring up that whole pattern of behavior with Tom Girardi in their sentencing memorandum, and I bet they are going to literally mention it all. And more house husbands in hot water with this Mauricio Umaski lawsuit. And what the media has gotten wrong is that they are reporting that he is being sued by Realtor LLC, and that's not entirely accurate. So in the interest of me not being able to not look at a headline and be like, well, actually, that's not correct, we're going to talk about this suit just briefly. He is being sued over Paycheck Protection Program loans that he and his company took during COVID. And I'm gonna read you just briefly some of the allegations in sum that he took PPP loan money that was meant to keep small businesses afloat, that his business actually thrived during COVID and after, and that his business actually increased in revenue. So when I say this is a lawsuit because of the defendant's greed, that is almost verbatim what the facts statement here says. But he is not exactly being sued by Realtor LLC. He is being sued by the United States of America XREL Realtor LLC. What that means is that the United States of America is bringing the suit because a private party can't sue over paycheck protection program fees. This is a bigger deal than being sued by another company. This is a suit over the PPP program. The information is coming from Realtor LLC, but the United States of America is the plaintiff or one of the plaintiffs here. XREL is the information's coming from Realtor LLC, but the authority is through the United States. So yes, there are AUSAs involved in this civil lawsuit, 
And yes, with the PPP, there are civil penalties and they are suing over that. So the United States of America, XREL Realtor LLC, are suing Mauricio, his business partner, William Rose, and the agency's holding company. The introduction of this complaint says literally, quote, this is a case about greed during a national health emergency. Umansky and Rose, through the agency, a corporation they formed in October 2017, applied for and received two PPP and CARES Act loans in the total amount of $3,521,153. These two programs were enacted for the sole purpose of preventing termination of employees by providing loans to businesses that were unable to pay them due to the impact of COVID-19, not to bolster or preserve profits of a business that had sufficient funds available to pay its employees. Yet the vast majority of the proceeds went to those very businesses, leaving many small businesses like restaurants, grocers, and other small businesses that were directly impacted by COVID-19 through lost business out in the cold. Which is a very fair point. Restaurants in Los Angeles were closed. Gyms were closed for a substantial period of time amongst other businesses, but interest rates were incredibly low and people were buying and selling homes frequently. The housing market did not stop during COVID in Los Angeles. Emily, really? Yes. Sold my house in California during COVID in Los Angeles. But the combination of interest rates being incredibly low and people being able to work remotely and choosing to move out of more densely populated areas really kept the real estate industry moving. Loans were being closed. Loans were being made escrow was closing, that industry was not as impacted as a restaurant that could not open its doors and serve food in the way that it had been set up to do. The complaint goes on to talk about the financial situation of the agency. It says, in fact, the agency's business grew massively during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2019, the agency had $6 billion in sales volume. That doesn't necessarily mean revenue because we're talking about real estate that doesn't necessarily mean profit because we're talking about real estate what that number indicates is the six billion in sales volume is how many houses were sold and if you're selling houses from the one to ten million dollar range the sales volume would be the total amount of the sale not the total amount that a realtor is going to take but it does indicate that in 2019 they moved to 6 billion in sales volume and in 2020 they moved to 6.5 billion in sales volume and in 2021 they moved 11.2 billion indicating that from 2019 to 2020 not only did their business not slow down it in fact grew by over 500 million dollars so no their business was not significantly impacted negatively by COVID. The suit goes on to allege that there were false and fraudulent representations made in receiving the PPP loans, that the loans were not necessary to support the ongoing operations and payment of salaries, and that it only bolstered their profits because they had adequate liquidity to continue doing business. It then goes on to say that the defendant's business revolved around the luxury real estate market, of white collar millionaires and billionaires who were not impacted by the pandemic. It says the agency does not deal in starter homes, but luxury properties for the rich and famous with their average sales price at 1.92 million. This contrasts with small businesses such as grocers, restaurants, and other companies that sell products and services who depend on the voluminous flow of customers. Defendants did not need that constant flow of customers to stay in business because they made significant profits from each luxury real estate transaction among their wealthy clientele. I think the most impactful part of the argument is that the business actually grew by over $500 million in volume from the year before, showing that they were not negatively impacted. Sales did not slow down in a way that impacted their sales volume. And then they go on to line out that the belief is that these were fraudulently obtained paycheck protection loans over three million dollars in loans and that they were forgiven and the ultimate cause of action here is false or fraudulent claims under 31 usc 3729 stating that there was fraud in applying for the paycheck protection program and the cares act 
and asking the court enter a judgment against each defendant in an equal amount three times the damage that the United States has sustained because of defendant's action plus a civil penalty of not less than $12,000 and not more than $25,000 for each and every false claim as required by law. That means if there was one misrepresentation, then it's a $12,000 fine. If there were multiple, it's $12,000 for each, up to $25,000 for each. But it's also three times the amount of loss sustained by the United States government, which is going to be that $3 million 3 x And the U.S. is asking for a jury trial on this. When I went looking at this lawsuit, there are an incredible amount of these actions being brought because now that we're four years out, as many mentioned when these programs rolled out, the fraud in the programs was going to be pretty significant. And the fraud in most of these cases seems to be perpetrated by large companies that were fairly savvy, who had relationships with banks, who told them what was coming up with relation to applying for the PPP. And the money for the PPP loan seems to have gone directly to these larger businesses first, not to smaller businesses that didn't have access to the bankers who had access to make these applications. So are we shocked at the end of the day that we are seeing billion dollar companies now getting hit by the government to get their PPP money back? No. Do I think it will ultimately just get paid? Probably. It's gonna be a lot cheaper than going through this litigation and it's probably better PR wise to just pay it and move on. And I think that's probably what we'll see here. But everybody forgets, well, you don't because you're a law nerd, but everybody forgets what I always say. The government will get theirs. The government will get theirs. If the U.S. government can find money that is outstanding that they are entitled to and then penalties that they are entitled to and potentially interest on penalties that they are entitled to, they will get it. And not reality TV, but I'm sure it's going to end up on TV. We need to talk about Corey Richens. Corey Richens is the Utah woman accused of fatally poisoning her husband. She's the one that wrote a children's book about grief after her husband was killed and then was on book tour for that when she was finally arrested over a year after his death. She also wrote that now infamous walk the dog letter where she talked about what the defense theory of the case was going to be. And we started to see that defense theory of the case play out in a Utah court when she went to preliminary hearing on August 26th and 27th. The purpose of a preliminary hearing is to bind someone over to trial or hold them to answer on a probable cause standard. And at the end of the day and a half of preliminary hearing and argument, she was in fact held to answer and bound over for trial. The trial date has been set for May 2025. So jury selection will begin right at the end of April. And by the time jury selection is done, we'll be right at the beginning of May to start that trial. It was a very interesting preliminary hearing. We heard from numerous witnesses, including a forensic accountant who is going to be a key witness in trial because the government's theory of the case is that the poisoning occurred because of a mounting financial crisis that Corey Richens had gotten herself into and that she wasn't aware that her husband had changed his will so that all of his property went to a trust for his children and the executor of that trust would be his sister and that Corey was not a beneficiary of that trust. We heard more details about when Eric Richens met with a divorce attorney for the first time to discuss the fact that it, he discovered Corey Richens was taking out loans against the home, which was only in his name, with a forged signature of his as alleged by the government. And we heard more text messages from Corey about what happened on February 14th, Valentine's Day 2022, ahead of Eric Richens' death on March 3rd, 2022. And that is a day that Eric Richens had a breakfast sandwich that was brought to him by Corey that made him incredibly sick. And the government charged an attempted murder as of that date. And they are basing a lot of that on various text messages from Corey. Interestingly enough, we also learned that Corey Richens' entire phone was not rehomed. Her SIM card was not destroyed and dumped in a trash can on a military base, but everything was deleted from January through March. The thing she didn't really count on is that her side piece paramour didn't delete his text message and her friends didn't delete their text messages and she did not wipe the victim's phone. So there are text messages on multiple phones and then they show no text messages on her phone. So the forensic and digital evidence is going to be very important here. But what we learned at preliminary hearing is she also had a journal where she was talking about the fact that she learned after February 14th that it was going to take 
more fentanyl to kill her husband, Eric Richards, and that it would take a, quote, truckload. And then we see text messages that she texted to the person who procured her the narcotics asking for something stronger. So that is really the foundation of the attempted murder charge. And then when he was killed on March 3rd, he was found with a substantial amount of fentanyl in his system over five times a lethal dose. And it was given to him, now we've learned, in like a lemon shot, not in a Moscow mule. So we learned a bit more about this case through the course of the preliminary hearing. There will be more hearings going forward, and I will be covering all of them. This trial is going to be incredibly interesting. Also coming up in trial in 2025. On Thursday, August 29th, I covered an extensive day of hearings in Idaho for the Brian Koberger motion to change venue. Brian Koberger's attorneys are arguing that the extreme media coverage of his case in the county where this happened, Latah County, Idaho, is too overwhelmingly prejudicial. There are too many jurors that have been exposed to it, and there is no way that he can get a fair trial in Latah County. They are arguing that this case should move to Ada County where Boise is. We've seen this in the Vallow Daybell cases where it was moved out of their counties to Boise. It is a larger city. It can accommodate a larger high-profile trial. This trial is set to start summer 2025 and last three to four months. It is going to be an extensive trial, but moving the entire prosecution, law enforcement, victims' families, witnesses 300 miles away can be incredibly expensive and onerous. At the end of a full day of witnesses, the government argued that the media exposure is similar in most counties and the remedy is to pull in a larger veneer of jurors like a larger potential pool pull in over 1800 people do surveys and do one-on-one -on -one voir dire and question people directly about what they've heard about the case what they've read and what they may know and go one by one so that people can be open and honest and so it doesn't taint other jurors if they hear what one person says so they say the remedy to this is casting a wider net of jurors. It doesn't need to move because there's news about this case in Ada County. There's news about this case in other states. There's news about this case around the world. So they don't need to change venue. They just need to pick from a larger pool of jurors. The defense argued that there is no way Brian Koberger can get a fair trial in Latah and brought in numerous scientific experts on things like media velocity and frequency and social psychology to support that position. The judge said that there was a lot to consider, that he wanted to review all of the case law before making his decision. And it's gonna probably be three to four weeks before we see a written decision from Judge Judge in Idaho. And also going to trial in 2025. Even though it's September and it's pumpkin spice season, it doesn't mean that it is all the way fall just yet. So making sure that that BO is under control is still something that needs to be considered because we're not hiding under sweaters just yet. And if that is on your mind too, it's time to consider Lumi. Lumi is a whole body deodorant that handles body odor for your pits and your parts and all the way down to your feet. Yes, I have used it on my feet and yes, it works really well there. And with scents like clean tangerine, soft powder, lavender sage, and fresh alpine or unscented, you can choose what works best for you. So if you're ready to try Lumi for yourself, Lumi's starter pack is perfect for you. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, the cream tube deodorant, and two free products like the body wash and deodorant wipes that I love. Plus you get free shipping. As a special offer for our listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you get the starter pack with its discount that's already applied, that's up to 40% off the starter pack. Use code EDBQB for 15% off your first order at lumideodorant.com. That's code EDBQB, like the quick bits, at L-U-M-E-D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T, Dot com. Let's get back to today's quick bits. Since the court in the Karen Reed case denied the motion to dismiss, her trial is still set for January 2025. But that's not the case we're talking about today. She has also been sued by John O'Keefe's estate, his parents, and his niece by way of John O'Keefe's mother. That wrongful death lawsuit involves not just 
those individuals suing Karen Reed, but also suing CF McCarthy's and the Waterfall Bar and Grill, alleging that they overserved Karen Reed, that that allowed for the infliction of emotional distress against the surviving family members because of what they alleged to be the DUI hit and run that killed John O'Keefe. There are numerous intentional infliction and negligent infliction of emotional distress causes of action here. Some of these causes of actions are going to be difficult based on the things that we've already seen in the criminal trial. It doesn't mean it's impossible, and it doesn't mean it's necessarily the goal. In the very beginning of this complaint, it says they are bringing the complaint to find justice for John O'Keefe. I think a lot of the goal here is probably discovery, which we have seen in other wrongful death lawsuits, and it's going to keep these families embroiled in litigation for potentially years. I will be following what happens in this suit. The causes of actions against the bars are going to be difficult, and I wonder if some of the other causes of actions, like the cause of action on behalf of John O'Keefe's niece, who he was the caregiver for, might resolve out of court before any of this goes much further. But it's very clear that John O'Keefe's brother, Paul O'Keefe, is angry. And of course he's angry at the loss of his brother. I don't know if this civil lawsuit is going to fix that. I don't know if a future criminal prosecution will fix that, especially because Massachusetts State Police is going to have a very difficult time going forward. But we will see how all of this plays out in court. People can bring lawsuits and those play out through the court systems and sometimes mediation, and we will see how it goes. But I broke that entire suit down on The Emily Show. If you want to listen to it on the audio feed or over on YouTube, it's there for you. And with that, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a Law Nerd, a busy week of law ahead. So stay in the loop on the Law Nerd app. And I hope these breakdowns of the cases we're covering and some of the cases I haven't gotten to just yet are helpful. And I will see you in the next one. Bye, Law Nerd. For deep dives into the stories that I covered here, you can find them on my YouTube channel at The Emily D. Baker and The Emily Show Podcast. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. The podcast goes live on Wednesdays. And if you want to stay in the loop with everything I'm doing, receive the fastest notifications out there and get more Law Nerd community, join me at lawnerdapp.com, our free app for iOS and Android.